Machine Guard. Peace, peace, peace and love, peace and love, peace and love, family. Peace and love. Cause I had to have twelve thirds. I'm just gonna kick it on now, and then we'll we'll pick it up from there. So yeah, peace and love, family. I just emailed you. I just emailed it to Yeah, just email. Just email. Got my swallow here. Jay Goodman. What's up, brother? Peace and love. And I talked to Ona Tonji today. You know Ona Tonji, right? Shout out to the Black Madonna. He has a living in the Venom. Man, I've been trying to get in contact with the people for so long, man. Yeah, bro, I was kind of getting all to, to do an event down there. Answer, he answered about 30 minutes ago. Oh, really? But I've known him for a while. I mean, you know, I sent folks to him. Yeah. Papers. He ordered books for me. Yeah. He has a uh, that's, that, that's something I've been wanting to do for a while is uh, host an event to try to Black Madonna, kind of like, like I was doing the HOC. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to House of Consciousness back, they had the little room. I'm not the one in the corner when they moved down to the spot they are now and, uh, and up in north. Yeah, um, Drea. So, Al Abenaki, Ralph, Abenaki, Ralph David Abenaki. What's that? Boulevard. That's where it's located. Oh, the Triangle Black Madonna. Yeah. Okay, now I'm talking about the um, House of Consciousness uh -huh. up in Norfolk, Virginia. Have you been there before? <laughs> no, I'm from the House of Consciousness of um, Sarnetta. Sarnetta, New York. Now, the, the one the one in, um, in Virginia. Um, on 38th Street, it's 38th parallel. The city, mm -hmm. seriously, mm -hmm. black side of town, always been that way. All right. Integration is coming now, or what they call it, uh, gentrification, integration. Um, but anyway, um, House of Consciousness used to be on the corner down there. Mm -hmm. The whole 38th Street, all black businesses always have been. Right. They're on the corner, and <laughs> they end up moving down the street to a little bigger spot. Um, but the one on the corner, man, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, everybody been in there. Um, with metaphysicist, um, the brother Deborah Blair, Blair. that everybody in there, Blair. you know, it's right there in Norfolk. Yeah. So they, they end up moving down the street to a bigger location, but they had a little back room, probably as, about as big as this right here. Mm -hmm. And I first stepped to them and said, Um, I would like to come down here on Sundays and, and teach. Like, what are you teaching? So I'm teaching everything. It's like, what do you mean everything? Because at that point in time, it was either the Hotep brothers or the Moors, it was yeah, schools, yeah. you know. I said, I, I want to teach everything. So they need a little back room in the back. Right. So I got the little back room in the back, small rooms, high as hell back there too. And I had three people come every Sunday for three or four months. I never promoted on social media on that shit. Then one day, because it was it wasn't for that purpose back then. Right. It was on Instagram. It was just Facebook, I think. All right. But um, I came one day. And it's like 15, 20 people in the front waiting or whatever. And Dre said, "They waiting on you. They know me. What the fuck." She said, well, you come out to the, the big, I want to go to the big part, but I have enough people. So now I got 15 people waiting on me. Now I got the stage, the mic, I got the whole thing now. Every Sunday after that, I had 45, 60 people in there every Sunday without, I never, I never, I never promoted it. I never promoted it. Yeah. But I taught them three people, like I had 80 people in the room. Three people. Yeah, they grew. Every Sunday, all I did was talk to people. And they went out and told people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fourteen years ago, when we started over at Little Five Points, that's 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 another spot too. Little Five Points. Yeah. What yeah. What did I hear from from him? Consistency. Mm -hmm. Yep. Patience. I'm, I'm I'm looking at all right. See, I I'm listening to you, Ponda, right, and I'm picking up patience yeah for sure consistency persistence persistence patience and it, and it grew and that's exactly yeah. that's exactly what it was exactly how it happened you know so when i came to hoc the first one in, in norfolk virginia mm -hmm. on the corner you know that's when the moors were like rah 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 hebrew israelites rah 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 
<laughs> I come in there. I, I was just a, a mason. I was worship for master of my lodge, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go out into the community and find other schools of thought to come into my lodge and teach, mm -hmm. which I later, I'll tell you about that later, but anyway, going to talk to these brothers in this HOT, like, you know, they, they checking me, like, who you belong to? Like, basically, like some gang related shit. Like, what school of thought? I'm like, I'm a Mason. Oh, yeah, Mason. They're going to more. You know, Mason is just more science. Da 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 da. It's long. Da da da. Like, what do you mean, Mason is more science? I never heard of more science. I never heard of it at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. I just had, did, did my shrine. Mm -hmm. I just had walk the burning sands, they call it, right? So now I was a noble. That's a, that's a, um, <laughs> that's the name of the Ashwine Temple. That's yeah. what, this is our name, but they yeah. use they use our name. Medina. They use our name. Right. Name right. The they got Aleppo. All the, all the Aleppo. Right. So two hundred and six of them in the world. That's it. So wow. I'm in the I know. I'm in the house of you conscience <laughs> with all these brothers, the hotel brother, everybody named you know, Mason. Yeah, right, 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 right. And I remember saying, um, well, I'm having an event at Norfolk State because I work at Norfolk State College. I had an event. I had rented the classroom three hundred dollars from the uh, the dean was cool with me and got the classroom for Saturday. And I had my flyers in there. It was packed in there. HOC was packed. And some dude said, "Man, it's the same night. Doctor Umar coming down here. Oh, you? I would do that. You can't compete with that man." Da, da, da. This back Umar was first popularized, right? I'm, I don't know. Talking about Umar Jones. Yeah. And I said to myself, I said, "Well, I don't know who Umar. I don't know who that is. I don't ever heard of him." And see. A lot of these people I was coming across the HOC was talking about people like Uma and Polite and people. I said, who the fuck is Polite? Who's these people? Yeah, yeah. I, I Excuse yeah, me, Polite. I'm like, but I, I was baffled because, see, when I came up into the knowledge, I came on the out of that certain month, Dr. John Henry Clark, Chancellor Williams. I came under them. So by the time I heard, and, and Dr. York, so by the time I heard Polite, I said, he's just repeating what? The elders said, but see, the young people didn't know the elders, so they thought the polite was just wow. Like, no, he's just repeating what Dr. York said. So I never knew them cat. So I got my flyer, a flyer down. I'm gonna have my event. My event was called the Round Table Discussion. I had Nation of Islam on my panel, I had more on my panel, I had uh Christian leadership, I had a master mate on my panel. I did it at North State mm -hmm. by myself. We showed Hidden Colors too. And I wanted to talk collectively about what's going on in the community, but I had all these schools of thought at the same table. I got a call about 7.30. A guy by the name of Angus Black said, uh, hey, well, Umar, man, I want to know if we come to your event and speak. I said, look at this. He had to come to my event now. Dr. Umar wanted to come to my event, and I was told not to do my event because he was in town. Wow. <laughs> I had 12 people at my event. Free. I'm my pocket. 12 people, bro. I said, if he come, he got to wait. I'm not going to give him no you gotta wait to speak because people are waiting to speak. Uma can't, Uma brought about 35, 40 people with him. We had to get a bigger classroom and everything. This is my event. And he waited all the way to the end to speak. <laughs> so I've been in situations, bro, that dealing with this information, dealing with what I know, I bear witness to things. I went through stuff, I've done stuff. Last one, I did an HOC United Roundtable discussion. I got, uh, he was assistant secretary, Dr. Uh, Mr. Farrakhan, Nation of Islam. He was on the panel, 5% on the panel, uh, Hotep was on the panel. I had a grandmaster mason on the panel. I had a pastor on the panel at North at, um, HOC. I sold out, packed. I donated all the money to one of the elders because he needed it. I didn't want the money, bro. It was like $700 something dollars I had raised. Gave it to the elder, needed for his medicine. I did it discreetly, though. You don't need to know all that. I knew he was going through. Take the whole basket, right? I got all the brothers on the panel. I got Moors and Masons in the picture connected, and they don't even know how they connected. But by this time, I don't went through the Masonic order. I got my forty third degree, and I got my ninetieth degree. And these are sealed. You see what I'm saying by the Grand Vizier, out of Cairo, Egypt. I helped found Temple Number Fourteen, More Science. When I came to the More Science Temple, I came with the Masonic school of thought. So when I seen the Morris brothers greet each other, I'm like, that's the five points of fellowship we do in the Masonic Lodge. When I seen the, the Morris standing 45 degree, I'm like, we do that in the Lodge. I saw everything that I saw in the Lodge in the Masonic Temple and the Morris didn't even realize it. They didn't realize that y'all doing the Masonic stuff. 
or the Masonics are doing y'all stuff. Either way, y'all don't know each other. So this one I joined the um, the Morris Rite three years ago and got part of the Morris Rite. You know what our ritual is? It's to lock arms and walk around a pole seven times. They don't even know the Circle Seven is in play. And I felt the need to let the Masons know what the Moors knew and let the Moors know what the Masons knew. Because it's all the same stuff. Like, why y'all so divided? It's the same information, Morris. That cool. So if you want, you got the link up right here. Uh, it says, let's check your camera and mic. That's fine. And then it says display name. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's the mic is on. I mean, it's, it's, the it's mic screen. is on, but it, on. I can't go any further. It says display name oh, in a studio. Put put your name in there and hit it in the studio. And then we're going we're gonna to be on the same thing. Peace and love, y'all. Hey, everybody ch tapping in, checking in. But the reason I mentioned all that was, mm -hmm. hold on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, Make sure my phone's on. I check my phone again. Make sure it's on. All right. Oh, you gotta move that mic. All right. Just, just, just leave it on mute. There we go. All right. Islam, Islam. Peace, family. How everybody doing? Peace. Everybody doing? Everybody good? Just checking in. So if you're on live so far, it's it's straight up, no chasing. Like we really talking, really building, all the stuff, you know. So. This particular segment is dealing with um, more so the um, connection of Moors and Masons. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we got good people in the building. You, you was tapped in a little bit early. You heard me uh, building with the brother because I felt like it was, it was it was definitely necessary for um, for the good brother to understand that I I've, I've been on this journey for a long, long, long time dealing with this information, uh, and a lot of a lot of this brother uh, works helps to, to bring it together. Um, so introducing the good brother Abdullah Bay. Tell people who you are, man, and what you got going on, brother. Yes, um, Abdullah Il Khalid Moksi Bay. You know, I, I have, um, this is my life's work right here. 20, 20 years, Moors and Mace Street, part one. Part two will be coming your way soon for the next three to four months. The next three to four months, I've done extensive research on Moorish history, dealing with the, the extensive research and the power of the Ottoman Empire and the Moroccan Empire, control of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. During the, fifth, during the 15, 16, 1700s, the same time period of the 
quote unquote, quote unquote, transatlantic slave trade. These two world powers, the Moroccan Empire and the Ottoman Empire, world powers controlling the Mediterranean and the Atlantic during the 15, 16, and 1700s. It's very important because that's the time period of the quote unquote transatlantic slave trade. Mm. All right. Mm. So then I have um, the sign of Copy Square, the connection to measurement and timekeeping. All right. This deals with the, the science of what actually masonry is. There are, there are, these, are not, these are not mere symbols, they are measurement tools and devices. All right. Then I have a, the Illuminati, Illumination of the Mind. All right. I get into placing the word Illuminati in its proper perspective, those who are, those who are conscious collectively. All right. Mm. We have my etymology. I've been studying etymology. Well, since 1998, I'm a student of Professor Burton, who sent the late Professor John Burton. And uh, since 1998, I've been teaching etymology since 2003 at the Temple University Pan-African Community Education Program. And I am also a co-founder of Academy of Providence. Uh, this is my book, Etymology and Vocabulary, Etymology and Vocabulary, something that you want. And I also have another book called The How Her Moon and Venus Rule. When I get into the meaning, the cosmological meaning of the five pointed star, the mm. 500, five hundred five five hundred eighty four day cycles of Venus, uh, Venus going between the Earth and the Sun five times in eight Earth years. Mm. So, so you see that five pointed star is a cosmological cycle of Venus. So you know, so I've been around for a while, so I've been <laughs> studying. Uh, Moorish history and science masonry uh, since 1993. You know, I've lectured in several places. You know, I'm also so let me, I'm also um, in the newspaper here. This is my yeah. newspaper. I'm the founder and editor in chief of the Masonic Gate. This paper's been out since 2000. Um, I think 2011. 2011. This this used to have been out since 2019. Since 2019, another issue will be coming out shortly after Moore's and Masonry um, hit hit your way. All right, so that's what's up, good brother. Listen, listen, listen. I finally listen. met I finally met Ponder, brother Ponder, uh, Peace, in uh, January, uh, January 24th at an event. Yeah, Tom hosted for sure. And, uh, for sure, one in Brown, New Jersey. For sure, for sure. There was an event that I put together, man. Um, in lieu of the one I was telling you earlier about the one I did in House of Consciousness. This was the part two of the round table discussion. Yes. And that's why yes. I had the Hebrew Israelites and the Masons and the yes. Moors and the preachers up there because I wanted to kind of um, emulate the same sentiments I did in Norfolk. And I look forward to doing that in Atlanta too, bringing everybody together. And, and my number one thing was the first one I did was all brothers. I told, because there's children in the audience too, I told the parents of the church, look on this panel. You see all these brothers up here? These are all brothers, regardless of their regalia or their costumes or their customs they have on. These are all brothers. These are the, the collectively the warrior class, the scholars, the protectors, the providers of the community right in front of you. I'm, I'm showing you these men right now. And that kind of took everybody guard now. Like, dang, I don't have to be so Moorish around this Christian brother. I don't have to be so Christian around this Masonic brother. I don't have to be these things around because these are my brothers. Right. right you know, right. and my whole thing was to present them to be naked of what they thought they had to be mm -hmm. and taught them what they needed to be for the community. That's the whole point. And because I've been in these various schools of thought, much too like uh, Dr. York, been in, when you sit in those different schools of thought, brother, you have a different perspective. So when I came into the Moore Science Temple and I had my Masonic rings and my, I, still, I, I still wear my Masonic stuff around them, and I was told that I had to take it off. And these Masons were these bad white people who took the land from the Moors. And it was George Washington. It was these Masonic people. And as they're going on with this jargon, I'm like, but where did Washington get it from? Because I knew of the connection from which it came for real. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know I knew that. So I, 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 I heard Moors say this stuff. And I would ask Moors about, what about Solomon Angelo? He was coined the Masonic Moor. He was cited as the founder of pure Masonic thought in Europe at a time of 1700, mm -hmm. turban and everything on his head. Why is there such a disconnect of the Moors when it comes to Moor Science Temple 
and a Masonic temple, in your opinion? What is the disconnect? All right. Uh, the disconnect is that they don't understand the the origin and true meaning of it. And this is where I come again with um, my Masonic Conference and Square book is to explain the origin and true meaning of what they call quote unquote symbols. And mm -hmm. so that's so that that's what that disconnect is not not on this having that the common origin and foundation of them all. And you you mentioned the different schools of thought, and and in fact there aren't different schools of thoughts. They're presented as different schools of thought or different religions. There's so that so that's so they set a false premise Got by it. using the word different. Mm -hmm. They set a false premise by putting the word s on the word culture. I won't put the word s, s on culture. It's culture, one world culture. One world culture. We go to the foundation. When people look at culture, they look at well, the foods. You know, say well, they'll say different. They'll say let's dance. The different dances. Well, are they the different movements? Yes, they're different movements. But the concept of the dances have a common origin. The turkey mm. dance. Mm. All right, harvest dance. They have a common origin, a common thread. But because people don't know the common origin, the common thread, and they just, they're, they're guided to a surface level and not the foundation and, that the, and the common thread that binds them together. So, what I, what, so this is what I do in my presentation to show how it's all interconnected, how it's all binded together. That is an ancient world culture, an ancient world civilization. And so this is this is the approach that I take. And in, in, in doing so, this is how we are we can reset or reestablish world harmony. Because as long as, for instance, so, someone someone said, uh, I think Malcolm X said this. Leave your religion at the door. Mm -hmm. Now. That's impossible to do. I know the statement is said, but that's impossible. Which means when they say leave your quote unquote religion at the door, it means leave your mindset. You can't. This that's illogical. The statement is illogical. You're asking for someone to drop their mindset at the door, drop how they analyze, how they analyze things. As you're talking, they, they 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 have a they have a paradigm that they've been indoctrinated with, and they're going to analyze what you're saying with with that. You're, you're telling them to leave that at the door. <clears throat> how how can they? They've been indoctrinated with that all their life. Well, so I I, I mean I just analyze the statement. I I've been since studying the etymology. I analyze everything, every word, every statement, every phrase. You know. Um, and that, and I was taught to do that and, and, in, my, and, in my in my in my um, lessons in my development right. to analyze everything. Right. And I just want to interject and add um, value to that. Um, one thing that I'm cognitive of is that the listening audience sometimes they're not as aware of certain things as we are. So even with you explaining that leaving your mindset at the door or leaving that at the door in the Masonic ritual, in the Masonic lodge, in the Masonic temple. And this is what I said earlier about one being speculative and then one being operative, right? Being able to operate in the craft, that statement alone tells me, I should tell any brother that you have to divest yourself of any instruments any instruments, that's the first thing they tell you, you have to divest yourself of that. Then they put you in triple darkness. Being in this triple darkness and you making an agreement to divest yourself, you are leaving everything you thought you knew at the door. You have to leave it at the door because you're entering to the unknown. You you know not of what's about to happen, so you have not yet formulated an idea of what to happen. So that, that is leaving your mindset at the door. It's what Brother Malcolm was saying. Is what I tell people when I do my events. Um, I, you can be a Christian, but just 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 
check your bag right here. You can get it back on my door because you can't come into this platform only thinking Christian. You can't come to this platform only thinking more science or only thinking masonry. And I sought to prove that at all three of these events by putting these different mindsets beside one another to show them that there is a commonality. There is something common amongst each other, but egos, I think, come into play, not the mindset. I think the egos for a man is hard to drop an ego. It's hard to drop an ego. So even though you say, hey, leave that religion at the door, I might leave my, I, I can leave Jesus at the door. But anytime I'm threatened or triggered, my ego quickly comes up and I'm going to grab it right back. So to your point, I'm playing devil's advocate, but to, to, to your point, you're right. You can't. Makes me wonder. It made me wonder when I came into the Morris Science as a Mason, why are these brothers so set on these dogmatic instructions from Noble Drew Ali? This is the next part of my question I have to ask you. Why are these brothers so dead set on these dogmatic decrees and bylaws from this individual? And who was he? In your opinion, was Noble Juwali a Mason? All right. So let me address the first Please. question. Uh, why are people so set in the, in the uh, dogma, dogma? All right. It would be a lack of study. I when I my for my for 20, 28 and a half years of observation and dealing with many, many people, you often hear people you hear people say, so and so said, Juali said, which means that they're not well studied and grounded, I mean that they can't give something that's well settled. Mm -hmm. Well, Juali said this, and based on well settled, based on my research and well settled principles, going back a thousand years or ten thousand years, Juali was correct. But they don't do that. They say Juali said, hmm. as opposed to showing documentary evidence to support what Juali said or where where what Juali is standing on is well settled principles. I don't hear that. I hear Juali said, so and so said, so and so said, so and so said. It's not according to, you know, multiple sources of well settled rent principles and research. Mm -hmm. It's so and so said. Sound right reason, yeah. It's not sound right reasoning. So that's where that's coming from. And this is from my observation of 20 and a half years. You know, then the second question. What's, is, what's Noble Juali a Mason? All right. Well, let's set the record straight. Are, are you, are you, are you, uh, let's be clear what we're asking for those who are listening. All right. Brother Pond is asking me, was Juali a member of the Amos or order in the lodge? Was you know was, was a member of the order in the lodge, all right. I don't have any documentary evidence. All right, so I don't have any documentary evidence because if I said yes or no, then I would have, have documentary evidence. So I don't have. I mean, so the logical position that I'm going to take is that I don't have any documentary evidence. I know that masonry is. You know, ancient science, ancient Moorish science, Egyptian, Babylonian, Chaldean culture and science. But you ask, he's asking me, is he a member of the order? But he actually was a member of a lodge. All right, so we just want to clear so because you understand that. What happens is the, the listening audience, their understanding would be that is that masonry is an order. You know, just like I said, chemistry. Well, well, chemistry, you have chemistry and chemistry club. They're not the same. Chemistry and chemistry club. Chemistry, chemistry class. Well, chemistry is the science. Mm. Now, chemistry, you know, chemistry teacher, 
chemistry class, chemistry. Well, you go to chemistry class to learn chemistry. That's taught by a chemistry teacher who went to school to learn chemistry. Chemistry. Yeah. All right. But chemistry itself is the science. You know, before the chemistry teacher, before the chemistry class, before the chemistry club. So I'm doing, I'm separating the chemistry, chemistry club, the chemistry, chemistry teacher, the chemistry class, and they have chemistry. And I'm just, I'm just like so people don't understand where I'm coming from. So once again, you got, so let's look at masonry. I'm, I'm, so I'm drawing a parallel, masonry and chemistry, masonry and chemistry. All right. You have masonic order. All right. You have someone who's studying all right, masonry, but you have masonry, the actual science has nothing to do with a club or an order. It's the actual science that was developed thousands of years ago and, and, and presented, misrepresented as symbols. They're not symbols. They're measurement tools and devices mis misrepresented as symbols. They're not signs. They're not symbols. There's no signs and symbols. They're measurement tools and devices misrepresented as signs and symbols. Give me an example. All right. The cross. The cross is not a symbol. The cross is a measurement device. It's called an iometer. I so the cross in the a 12-inch ruler will be in the same category. A 12-inch ruler is used for measurement. So it's a cross. The cross is a diameter, all right? A towel with a nam with notches on it. You know, you know, we have famine or inundation, all right? Placed in a winding staircase in a shaft, all right? So cross and a 12-inch ruler are in the same category, both used for measurements. Now, 12, three-year-olds, Three-year-olds know what a 12-inch ruler is. They've seen it on Sesame Street Place or other places. They've seen a 12-inch ruler. They know that a 12-inch ruler is not a symbol. A, a three-year-old knows that a 12-inch ruler, because they know the function. As soon as a three-year-old sees a 12-inch ruler, they've seen it on TV. They've seen somebody use a 12-inch ruler. What goes to their mind is the application and function of the 12-inch ruler. Now, the reason why that's not the same over the cross, because the masses of people don't know that know the function of the cross. That's all it is. Now, I used to think that if I don't so when I see a cross, I need to go to what? The function of it, because I know the function. So once you know the function of it, you no longer view it as a symbol. That's all that is. I'm no different than you. I want you to the symbol. I no longer view it as a symbol. I no longer view it as a symbol because I know the function of it. And that's the and, and, that's and, new study. And, and, and that's undeniable information. Um, and it came from, because people are still kind of tapping in right now. It came from the question of me asking, was Noble Jew Ali a Mason? Was he a part of a Masonic school of thought? At any point of time, did he dive into it? Much like asking him was um, Elijah Poole Bay, if, 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 if he was ever in the Masonic Lodge. Mm -hmm. And I want to set the premise to the audience, because I like to be fair to my audience as, as well, um, to, to give them the full spectrum of the conversation. Um, we have to understand historically, between the years of 1868 and about 1923, 27, in North America, there's a couple of different things going on historically. Not only did you have the Great Depression, but you also had what was called the Second Great Migration um, happening. You also had what was called the Third Great Awakening happening in America. So it was three different uh, vortexes of energy shifting through North America historically that happened. The Third Great Awakening was a huge religious movement of what they call Mahatmadian, uh, 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 what they call Mahometanism. Uh, first out of Detroit or Ohio, Indiana, I'm sorry, Indiana. Um, so you would see the trail from um, Noble Jew Ali 
to honor Elijah Muhammad, Nation of Islam, these organizations, Muslim organizations coming through Indiana, Detroit, Chicago, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, it's the same belt line they follow. Uh, so historically, the Muhammadism was coming to a North America. You had the second, yeah, the second uh, grand exodus of Negroes coming out of the South going into more industrial textile jobs in the Chicago, Detroit, Flint, Michigan, um, so on and so forth. So a lot of our people coming from the South were under the premise of what they call the old Methodist um, teachings. And a lot of black preachers, the so-called Negro preachers in the early 1700s through the late 1900s were all Methodists. There was no such thing as a Baptist black teacher, uh, a minister, preacher, sorry. Uh, that exists, all Methodists. Crispus Attucks was a Methodist preacher. Prince Hall was a, also a Methodist preacher. You would see uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, <laughs> his father, all come from Methodist or Presbyterian backgrounds because Negroes were only allowed to deal with that. My point is this, after doing my studying, because I really wanted to find out was, was, was Jew Ali and all these people, what were they before they became this? And not making it about noble Jew Ali, but just understanding the title of noble. Because when I became a, to the shrine temple, I was bestowed the title noble. They don't explain your nobility. Nowhere in the Masonic Lodge, brother, do they ever explain your nobility. Nowhere in the Masonic Lodge do they ever tell you that you're Hiram Abiff. You're actually Hiram Abiff, brother. You was hitting your head carried to the North Country and buried under shallow grave. You need to be raised marked by sprig of acacia. They never tell you this information. Um, so when I began to teach in the Masonic Lodge information that was beyond the ritual, I got excommunicated. <laughs> they, they, literally, they literally ran me out of the jurisdiction. I didn't understand you understand? That. Because I was, I was both a past master at this time and I was a Grand Lodge Junior Warden. For those of y'all don't know, once you become a junior warden of the lodge or the grand lodge, you now are charged with the discipline of teaching everybody. So as the grand lodge junior warden, now I had 12 subordinate lodges to teach, but had about 60, 70 members each, over 3,000 people I could teach at one time because I had got advanced to that level. I flew through Masonic, because I know history. I flew through it, no problem. I got pulled to the side, and I was told by the deputy and the grand, past grandmaster at the time, don't go teaching them that information that you'd be talking about. Word for word is what they said to me. Over in the corner, congratulations, brother. No, I'm getting congratulated, pat on the back. They said, don't go teaching them that information. What information, brother? Telling them that who they really are. When I came into the, uh, the Mahora Science Temple, the same thing happened to me. <laughs> and I'm wondering, is it me? Do I have a problem? Because these Moors don't know the connection between the Masonic. And you were the only brother that I seen dealing with that information. Drawing the line, dot for dot, from Moors and Masons. I almost got beat up when I said no with you, Ali was a Mason. That's why I asked you that question. Right. I almost got beat up. But I had knew that Noble Jew Ali or Timothy Drew was a student of somebody else. He was a student of another brother. Who was from Egypt, who was the first one in 18, what, what was that, 1868, 72, had affairs on before anybody in the Morris Temple of Science. That's a brother from uh, in New York, Brooklyn. No, he's from, he's from, he's from, um, he's from, yeah, um, the Jewish, Morris Jewish, no, 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 not that one, not that. Uh, it's coming my head, it's, it's coming to me in a second, but anyway, mm -hmm. he was a student of him, Noble Jew Ali. That's why the newspaper article, if you see the newspaper article, you can Google it. It says, Timothy Drew, the Egyptian adept student. student. Like, All students adult. have a teacher. Who is his teacher? I wanted to know. Coming to find out that once Drew Ali was taught by this brother, I'm going to call his name in a minute, Deuce Muhammad Ali. Deuce Muhammad Ali was noble Drew Ali's teacher. Deuce Muhammad Ali. Deuce Muhammad Ali was in America with the fair zone before there was a more science temple even thought of. He was also an advocate for uh, black nationalism. So he was also a teacher of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. He was his teacher. A brother by the name of Solomon from Egypt came over and had, and had an event in New York in the late 1800s. He said, there are no black shriners in America. 
Ain't no such thing as a black shrine in America. If y'all want to be shriners or nobles, come under me. And they all, like, it's a newspaper article in New York. 700 Negroes in New York at this Grand Masonic Lodge oh, that's meeting. That's the uh, ancient, ancient, ancient Egyptian Arabic order of the nobles of Mr. Shrine. There you go. Yeah, that's right. Ancient Egyptian, and this brother. The ancient Egyptian Arabic order of the nobles of Mr. That's it. That's it. And yeah. this brother there you go. Yeah, and so another make, brother, the they got together, and guess where they went? Newark, New Jersey. And they resurrected, they reestablished the, the Can temple. Canaanite temple. They reestablished the it. Canaanite temple. It's always said, no more do I leave. I reestablished. Yeah, he called, he put the word old in front of it. Now, the Solomon the and Timothy the Drew was in New Jersey together. Oh, that's why, oh. Watch this. Now, what, what Timothy Drew didn't like That's was, exactly, what Timothy Drew didn't like was the fact that Solomon was Maybe. implementing Masonic movement inside the temple. So Timothy Drew left the Moorish Temple of Science and went to Chicago to start what? The Moorish Science Temple. And you would see a lot of colloquialisms with the Masonic and the Moorish legacy tied together because timothy drew came out of that school of thought to know about the sphinx in the right hand the yeah, noble jewelry right. came on the left hand of the sphinx why the left hand it's left hand that the grandmaster raised up higher before it's a lot of similes in there that if you're not a mason you wouldn't know if you're not morris you wouldn't know you just go off thinking that they're two different fascists but it's the same situation so me telling these brothers that you see that though Absolutely. You see how they go together? No, you know, you, you're, what you're doing is you're explaining Noah Jolly's path. That's it. His path of development, his school, his path of where he got the information from, where he learned. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Yeah. That's all but I was it, doing. It was, the old, it was the Canaanite temple. And then I, and I knew that. And I knew that Jolly added the word old, but reason why he adds an old Canaanite temple, because it's a, the old meaning that He's bringing that which already existed. Old Canaanite temple is that it's just not, it's nothing, it's not new. No. Not new. No. That's that's why. Not at all. And he had his old Canaanite Not Canaan at all. Temple. The old Canaanite temple. Right. And if you research the old Canaanite temple, that comes from the Ben Ishmael tribe. The Ben, the, the ben Ishmael ben tribe. Ben Ishmael, yeah. Right. Who got ran out of Indiana by um, uh, right. Mary Birth Troll League. I got you. So Go ahead. now, and that's why any anybody that's listening to me right now know that um, know that history. I've always been able to unravel mysticism and and, and fables and, and romanticizing stories yeah, yeah, yeah. through <laughs> extensive historical research. Yeah, very and years ago, when I was at the House of Consciousness, the old one in, in Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. and I got into a conversation with a couple of elders, and I spoke for three hours straight with no bathroom breaks, no water, no nothing. And I think I started at the Wormian Ice Age, like and I start and I ended in eight, 1965. Mm -hmm. And these elders said, "Brother, you got something, man. You got something." And when I talk about history, I see it kind of like the Matrix. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to you about 1492, or I can talk to you about 1489, when Columbus was looking for somebody to sponsor his ship. I can go back further than that, but keep on the same path. I can tell you what's happening in Europe in the 1400s and bring you over here to America to have it at the same time simultaneously. See, most people get fixated on one time period, and they only can talk about one mm -hmm. time period at a time. But what was happening in ancient Yucupta, ancient yeah, Egypt, yeah. that was happening over here in these empires at the same time. Anybody that's an Egyptologist or a hotel brother, they get confused between the two, the two uh, periods. They talk about ancient Egypt, you know, or Egypt. They don't talk about ancient Egypt, which is AM, pre-dynastic period. They don't know much about pre-dynastic Egypt at all. They can tell you all about Mayat, and Mayat was under the deities of the Ogog. They don't talk about the primordial deities. They don't know about the primordial deities, the Nana Sin. They don't know about the Nana Sin. They only know what that is. These were the primordial gods that gave birth to Mayat and going back to Sepnut and going back all the way back to Shu. 
and they don't know that far back. So what I realized is when brothers talk history, they're fixated to one time period. And they don't know how to talk around the whole world. They don't know world history. So I learned and was taught world history. And I was told by my teacher, you have to put people in time and space. Otherwise, it's just barbershop talk. Oh, man, the white man wrote the Bible. Da, 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 da. When did he write the Bible? Mm. What language was it in? When was it printed? Where? If I tell you that in 1462, Johannes Gutenberg in Woodbridge, Germany, Gutenberg Press. tried to print the first print, but Johannes Fuss lent him money. So Johannes Fuss took the printing press back to Europe. If I give you those historical points about history, the who, the way, it becomes fluid. You get the whole picture. And not just tell you about Moors and 7-Eleven Moors. And if I ain't tell you about the Moors from Moo, if I ain't tell you about the Moors from Moo, I'm doing you a disservice. Because now I got you thinking that these Arabs ruled the entire planet. They didn't rule the entire planet. I'm going to give you a time period about some, about some Berbers, they call them who were religious converts who became Moriscos, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you that paradigm that a Morisco actually brought Columbus over here. The Moors were the reason that this empire fell over here and show you how. Historically, the Moor who rode with Columbus and why he was at Columbus, they always tell you that, you know, Moor God at Columbus, yeah, they Moors, yeah. And this is the symbol for the Moorish right. It's a coxal wheel. It's a sailboat that's the, between the square and the compass. That's the symbol for the Moorish rite. And these Moors know more about that pretext of that civilization of Moors, 7-Eleven, than Moors inside the temple do. And Moors uh, inside the temple know no history. Nope. They can't give you no history, brother, about nothing. They give you two and five, right? And that's it. They give you little colloquial quotes. Think not with the food, nor pretend it wise. The ox knows not he's being fat for slaughter. It's, they can give you all that. They can give you that jargon all day long, but when it came to the history part of it, I found out they didn't know anything. So I'm saying this in, in Cloma Pastor Mike. Mm -hmm. When I saw your literature, you were the only, the first one that I saw making that connection between. And I asked myself, so how did his brother, is he a mason? <laughs> I was puzzled. I'm like, how's his brother? Why he got the triple tie you and the 32 camps? And why he got these, these these Masonic symbols on his stuff unless he's a Mason? And you even had the the, the, the square compass on. Is it your Mason brother? And your answer was simple, like no. Not not in the order. Not yeah, but, not in the order. But see, yeah, but I came up in a day with Masonry, they should have get tucked from you. Like, I came up, this is me coming up in masonry now. I came up in masonry where you got something on, a ring or a charm or anything on, and I asked you a question like, where you find that at? And if you don't respond yeah, to me, in kind to that question. if you don't respond, because see, y'all know me. I, I don't believe in this secret shit. I tell exactly what it says. I don't believe in that. I told the mason one time, so you got any secrets, brother? Take them secrets down to the corner, get them brothers out the corner. You got any secrets, go change the community, financial state. Mm. But you ain't got no secrets. So stop pretending. That, now, I'm going to tell you something sacred that should be kept secret. When the brother tried you and asked you where you find that, at, the response is, I find it behind King Solomon's temple. <clears throat> in a rubbish pile, they say. And you had to dig through the rubbish pile to pick it up. How did you pick it up? 357. That's the whole response. That's a whole jargon for every... For every degree you get, first degree, all the way through 32nd, all the way to 90th degree, there's a whole jargon you have to memorize and repeat. Well, let me give him 357. Since you mentioned 357. Let's do it. All right. All right. So since she mentioned, since Ponder mentioned 357. All right. So Listen, y'all better get your pens and paper out, man. Let's, let's get, let's, let's deal with 357. All right. All right. Right. You have the, what's called the winding staircase. The winding staircase, there's three steps of st stairs. You have 357. All right, the three, the three deals with Orion. The Orion belt is a three, three pole stars. You have Taurus. Taurus is a constellation, a star of five stars. You have Pallades, seven stars. That's your three, five, seven. 
So that's what's called the great celestial conjunction. Mm. All right. The great celestial conjunction. Once again, this is my Masonic Compton Square and the connection to measurement and timekeeping. To get my book, you go to morsemasonry.org. So this is so that's so listen, how dimension three five seven. I'm gonna give you the science, the astronomy of three five seven. Taurus, uh, Orion, Taurus, Pelé, that's called the great celestial conjunction. So, so no, he's right now. They also ask you, Masonry, on that same breath. Now, they ask you, how is your how is your lodge covered? The response is in a clouded canopy of stars or a stared, stared, decorated heaven. One more time. They ask you, how, how is your lodge situated? East due west from the highest mountain to the lowest valley to keep out all cows and eavesdroppers. What is it? What is it covered with? It's covered with a clouded canopy or a stair deckered heaven of stars. And the brothers just told you the three star systems. Yep. The three star systems. One more time. Tell them one more time because they caught that. All right. Orion, Taurus, and Pleiades. Orion is a quote, is a constellation of three stars. Taurus, a grouping, grouping of five stars. Pallades is a grouping of seven stars. We're three, five, three, five, seven. It's the winding staircase in Masonry. Now, there are brothers who know about the winding staircase but cannot make the astronomical connection. The ascension up there. No, they can't. Yes. They can't. They can't. Now, on my page, I also did a measure where I, I oh mean, I, I, just talking to you now, brother, I did a measure called. Um, the keys of Solomon's Temple. I did a measure called Revealing the Masonic Code Part 1 and 2. Um, I did one called Get Out of Your Car Picking Mind. Um, but the one that I was dealing with, the keys of Solomon's Temple, I dispelled the 357. And I'm going to tell you why. Most brothers who, and I, and I apologize ahead of time, uh, if you are a Master Mason or Third Degree Mason, you may want to cover your ears. Um, <laughs> Brothers who are just third degree Masons or, or so called master Masons, I tell them, I say, well, you're not yet a Mason yet. What you mean? Can you travel? Yeah, yeah, I'm a traveling man. Do you have the password to travel? Yeah. No, you receive a temporary password because it told you that what? Hiram Abiff, Hiram Tyree, and Solomon, the three grandmasters. Hiram Abiff was carried off and murdered by. Jubilo, Jubilee, and Jubilam. Now, their real names are Gravlot, Cubellum, and Acrop. Acrop, Gravlot, and Cubellum. Who represents who? Simon, right? Uh, uh, Levi, and Reuben, who try to get the password from Tahar and kill Tahar. It's the same story going down to They don't know that, though. So when I tell them that you have not received the master's word to travel, nor do you have your mark, because anytime a mason would go build something, he would leave his mark on it, making them a mark master, or a most excellent master, or a perfect master, or a virtual past master, which is the 14th degree. And I say it is not until you get into the red house that you become a true master mason, able to travel and leave your mark. Anytime their master masons were building in King Solomon's temple and they got to a doorway, they had to stop, because the raw art masons had to come and place the keystone, the tripatayu, in the center of it, keystone, and those and masons couldn't touch like it. Those master masons couldn't touch the keystone because they had not yet ascended to that level of understanding what the keystone was. And that keystone or that tripatayu represents the three new grandmasters, who are Joshua, Haggai, Zerubbabel. Mm -hmm. You see that? That's the returning back to rebuild the temple for the second time. Remember, you mentioned these three now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's look at this three. And we, we talked about the mission that the three that Orion is a grouping of three stars. Mm. And you have what's called the, the three pyramids of Giza are lined up according to a, a, a Orion's belt. Yep. Now, the Orion plays because you mentioned the three, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm going to explain that. Orion is very is key. Then you have what's called the helical rising. Of Orion, and you have the dread, the the dread pillar. The mm -hmm. dread pillar represents 
the Orion, the helical rising of Orion. Well, you have the dead pillar like this, and then it rises. And, mm. and going, going around November, around November 22nd, is where you have the helical rising of Orion. Now, there's three, there are Orion, Taurus, and Sirius are three major constellations around no, between November to January 1st. This is key. Orion is the pointer or guider because of Orion to find other major constellations of stars, you, you first look for Orion. And Orion will guide or arch or point the way. All right? Mm. So now you have these, you have what's coming up now, leading until you have Orion, there's November 22nd, the helical rising, around that time, a real helical rising of Orion. You have this Christmas star. The star on the Christmas tree is Sirius. Now, January 1st, January 1st is where is Sirius is in the midheaven, in heaven, the highest point in the sky. So you have 10, 9, 8, Happy New Year's. It's not actually New Year. It's where Sirius is in the highest point in the sky. Mm. It can be seen in most parts of the world. That's January 1st. Now, the presidential inauguration, January 20th, where Sirius is in the night sky the longest, the 20th. Now, the president of the United States presidential inauguration was not always on January 20th. The president of the United States prior to 1933, the president's United States presidential inauguration was on different dates between mid-March and mid-April. Why? Because the president of the United States presidential inauguration was fixed to Venus. Venus is not fixed. The helical rising of Venus is between mid-March and mid-April. It's not fixed. So they wanted a fixed star, which is serious, the dark star. So they so they changed to a to an amendment to have it for January 20th. That's why it's January 20th every four years, because Sirius is fixed. January 20th is where Sirius is in the night sky the longest. January 1st is where Sirius is in the, the sky, the highest point in the sky can be seen in most parts of the world. Once again, well, January 20th, January, July 4th, July 4th is the Egyptian New Year, was called the helical rising of Sirius. And that where, where Sun and Sirius are in zero degrees of separation or conjunction. And that brings about the flooding or, or the inundation of the Nile River. Once again, that, that cross, the tower cross is placed within a winding, a shaft, and you have the winding stairs and there's notches. The cross is a diameter measuring the flood lines. So sometimes it's flooded and it was, it was meticulous record keepers that were kept. This was the survival. Mm. That now, because when, when the Nile River flooded, you it, the, the soot of black mud rose, rose to the surface and fertilize the Nile River. Now, prior to that, you have your 357 or your, 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 or your, um, your 345, your 345 of the, the 345 triangle. Three square plus four, four square equals five square. So that's three, that's nine, three square nine, four square 16 equals 25. All right, that's your 345 three, triangle. So you have their, their in, in sonic orders, they have their notches, all right, what they call rope stretch, rope stretchers, rope stretchers, all right, three notches, four notches, five notches. Mm -hmm. That's your three, four, five triangle, mm -hmm. all right? So, we, so we're looking at the quote unquote Pythagorean theorem, all right, three square plus four square equals five square, all right? So that folds out, you know, to a nine, 16, all right, six, not nine squares, 16 squares, 25 squares. All right, so this knowledge, so that so that was actually marked out, you know, for agriculture and for so for survival, the Nile Valley civilization. Mm. So what I've so these are not symbols that have application. Speculative and, and operative. All right. So I have that in my Masonic Compass Square in the connection to timekeeping and measurement. Once again, go to morrisonmasonry.org. 
So I wow. just wanted to give you, you know, as wow. you're talking, I want to make no, no, no. And I appreciate right. you. You know, what I'm saying you, you coming, you coming through and and, and adding that because I'm I'm learning. Um, I don't know so much uh, above as I do below. Um, but we complement each other. We facts, 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 facts. So what I was mentioning just now, let's let's get into some history right quick. Um, mm -hmm. As what's your knowledge on the Knight Templars as the role they played with the toppling of much of all right the empire yes all right so let me let me give me this now you have what's called the crusades against the moors the crusades against the moors between 1090 to 1235 so it's called the crusades against the moors and after after 1235 the only moorish kingdom or stronghold was granada so from 1235 to 1492, Granada stood alone, the only Moorish kingdom in, Ma in Phoenicia, modern day Europe. Now, the Knights Templar is one knight order that was established to fight against the Moors. Mm -hmm. All right, so I just want to, because I want to place the Knights Templar with other knight orders, because that mm -hmm. was not the only knight order that was established. Hospitalers. All right, yeah. Knights, Knights St. John's or Knights mm -hmm. of St. John's or Hospitella. All right, Knights of St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the, 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 the Knights, the Knights of Malta. Yeah. Well, the Knights of Malta was, it wasn't called the Knights of Malta. It was called the Knights of Rose. They were given the honorary title Malta mm -hmm. in 1525, something around down that time period. The Moors fought the Knight Order, Facts. and and on the island of Malta, Facts. they were given the uh, the title Malta after the name of the island, Knights of Malta. So you have the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Hospitella, the Knights of Calatrava, the Order of Christ. And these are orders, you know, the German, uh, um, Argonne, and Castile, and France, and England, and Germany, and Portugal, and Spain. They all established night orders to fight against the Moors. They launched the crusades against holy the wars. Moors. Holy wars. All right. They're called holy wars or crusades yep. against the Moors. This is that we're going to lead up to this. Once again, 1235 was the, was, was the, they, they defeated the Moors in, in Vince Valencia, in Seville, and uh, and other areas in there too. Granada was the last stronghold. Yep. Now, Abu Muhammad, the Emir, the Caliph Abu Muhammad, he so he signed the surrendering treaty of Granada on November twenty fifth, fourteen ninety one. It was put into effect in January fourteen ninety two. A year and a half later, Pope Alexander VI, on March 20, March 4, 1493, issued a royal decree to authorizing Spain and Portugal to set, to colonize North Central South America. That, that is called Intercaterra Divina, the doctrine of discovery. In school, Intercaterra Divina is taught as Christopher Columbus discovered America. But it's not just from Columbus discovered America. It's Inter Catera Divina, Pope Alexander VI, Royal Decree, Papal Decree, March 20, March 4th, 1493, authorizing Spain and Portugal to colonize Moorish, Moorish land, North America, Central America, South America. That is in play today. And once again, in schools, it's called Christopher Columbus discovered America, but it's actually Enter Catera Divina, March 4th, 1493. This is all interconnected. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, the harvest was acknowledged as proper in October. It was President Abraham Lincoln that, through a presidential proclamation, changed the harvest, which you can't do. I mean, you know, because it's, it's based on cosmology and astronomy yep. all right but change the celebration of the harvest to the third thursday in november now why that march 25th is always going to be close to or the third thursday in november will always be close to march 25th november november 25th november 25th 1491 
that ended Moorish power and reign in Europe. Mm. The key now in the Treaty of Granada, it does preserve Moorish personal rights. So it did not absorb Moorish personal rights. It protects Moorish personal rights to Moorish per property in that Treaty of Granada. So this is all interconnected to the day. Mm. And remember, he asked me a question about Max Templar. How I'll make the connection? Now, I want to... It's all connected. I want to dove a little bit deeper. And when we're talking about the, the Knight Templars, now I'm going to go back to mm -hmm. around 1096. And I also cover this a little bit in my lecture, um, Keys to Solomon's Temple. Um, but we have to understand there was no such man as, as Solomon, um, at least not in the biblical narrative, as no. we know. And I've showed you guys several times how to break down the word Solomon by removing the O's and dealing with what's called the abjad, removal of vowels. And those three O's become salt, sulfur, and mercury. And those four letters, S, L, M, N, become variant degrees of how to build on the prism, or build Solomon's temple on the prism to a protractor um, as the celestial bodies move through the sky. And I've done it on the horizon several times with y'all. I don't know if y'all caught that measure or not, but that's what Solomon is. Now we're dealing with a man by the name of Solomon ben Isaac. The word ben, B-E-N, or, 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 or bar, means son of. Solomon ben Isaac. In 1096, he sends Godfrey of the Bullion, Walter the Penniless, and Peter the Hermit. He sends those three into Northern Africa, it was called Turkey today, to establish Solomon's temple, the person. Solomon was a, his family was uh, grape growers, vineyard keepers. He was a baron, and we know what barons are. We know who a baron is, Lombards, capitalists, mostly uh, Jews. And these barons had their secret wars going on, skirmishes, along with these holy wars. And these barons banded together uh, to usurp the king's orders. Again, Solomon ben Isaac, look him up. He sent Walter the Penniless, Peter the Hermit, and Godfrey the Bullion. He sent them over to establish a wall city in Isbain, Turkey, Espanola, Turkey. And that wall city became the temple of Solomon ben Isaac. They were ran out of there in 1191 by the Mamrith Egyptians. Okay, so prior to that, them, them, these, these, these poor fellows of Christ, they call them for sympathy, traveling through the deserts, they encountered um, certain individuals. They encountered nobles, and oftentimes these Christian Christian warriors and these nobles would sit down mm -hmm. and have conversations. Later, you're gonna find out this is how these 16 white boys in New York come back to start this right here through a story they heard being told by some individuals right and showing you this sabotage let's deal with this for a second we're talking about yeah, nobles yeah. nobility yes. this sabotage or this sword this egyptian head rest right here and what you've been taught that's a star and crescent moon who told you that these are the claws of the Bengal tiger these are claws of Bengal tigers. Go look it up. These, this is not a moon or what they call a crest. That's an illusion because the Islamic flag looks like this. You think it's that. You think it's a star, the moon, the sun, the womb. If I do this right here to, that, to it and talk about the moon and the star and the crescent, I take you to Revelation 22 where it talks about the virgin trying to escape from the dragon while she's standing inside the moon crest with the sun over her head. Y'all yeah. remember that story? Right. That's what it's talking about. So this symbol is dealing with a lot, but I just wanted to clear it up. This is the claw of the Bengal tiger. And this sabotage was the weapon that was used by these uh, Moorish warriors, these these nobles. And I tell brothers all the time, brother, brothers do not be shriners. We're nobles. The Europeans are shriners. They have to guard the shrine. They've been tasked with guarding the shrine. Yeah. They they have to stay right. They have to stay in, in, in mourning. They stay in mourning. They can't celebrate nothing, right? And those <laughs> you've seen the uh Shriners Temple, uh Shriners Hospital Children's Hospital. Yeah. And the association with these shriners 
Europeans always having a child in their arm, and mm-hmm. yeah. they were sent to guard the yeah, I- staff. To lead the way, but they were sent to guard the, the Ali child. That staff represents the three wise men who came to see Jesus. And the Eastern Star Order, what did they ask? Have you seen a star in the East? I have. What do you come here to do? I come to worship him. That's the correlating response to that situation. But these three magi, these three magus, these three magicians who came to see baby Jesus, mm-hmm. this is who the Shriners Hospital is emulating. They're emulating their honor to guard the Ali child. They call them the Ali child. They, they, they know who the real Ali's are. They, they know who the real Khalees are. They know who the real heirs of their state are. But they've been sworn to guard this secret. I was told by an older European mason back in Norfolk, man. He was 33rd degree at the time. In their lodge, at a certain age, they pay for a flight for their brothers to travel back overseas to see the real body of Hiram Abiff. And it's a black man. But they're sworn to secrecy, to guard that secret of them knowing who Hiram Abiff truly is in that order. It's a lot of brothers come back and they leave, they leave the temple. Some brothers go on with the information, knowing, okay, well, that's what it is. But a lot of the white boys don't like that. So what am I saying? The Knight Templars, also had conversation with some shriners or sorry nobles out in the desert they come to formulate the order known as the shrine temple in new york i think it's right 1886 if i'm not mistaken these 16 16 white boys come back from new york and they start their thing these three crestrians i told you about Godfrey the Bullion, Walter the Peerless, Peter the Hermit, who came into Isbain, Turkey to set up that temple. The Temple of Solomon is erected to a man by the name of Solomon Ben Isaac. When I'm in the Masonic Lodge telling this story, they don't like to hear this shit. They don't like to hear the history of nothing I speak about. <laughs> Prince Hall, because I had left, I came in under what was called um, Scottish Rite, R I T E, Rite, Ritual. Everybody has their own ritual. Prince Hall was allowed to join Irish Rite. Prince Hall is not a right. And I'm telling these Prince Hall brothers, y'all are not even a right. Y'all don't have your own order. Y'all come under the Irish Rite order. Who Prince Hall, who was a slave, brought here by William P. Hall, and this your servant, brought him by William P. Hall, his master. Prince Hall, real father, was a, uh, a front. He made furniture. He was a mahogany wood maker out of Barbados. That's where he come from. Prince Hall himself is half Irish and half African. That's his pedigree. Why is that? A lot of much when this transatlantic slave trade started, it was Irish indentured servants being sent down to the Bahamas to harvest yeah. sugarcane. Look up, look up, I, look Michael up, Red Legs. Michael Hoffman, they were they were white and they were slaves. Michael look, Hoffman, they were white and they were slaves. They he called him Red Legs. Goes and he has yeah. uh, he shows the. Um, the documentary evidence of, of state records, state records that's not, you know, that's available but not taught in the general public. That's that there was that the Irish were worked, the Irish worked on the farm. Though I, that's what he's talking about. It what what we see in movies of our people, a lot of people worked in cotton fields and to, to get beat and all that. What he's all right. That happened to them. That's the what uh, that's so they can understand. <laughs> no, because it's not told, it's not known. They all right. Facts. When they are right, when they talk about picking cotton, getting bit and all that, they only look at people that look like us. They never they don't we don't envision, not even the Albion, they don't envision people that look like Donald Trump in the fields working hard. Busting their butt, get, they don't envision that. I'm saying they were white, they were slaves by Michael Hoffman. You just want to just paint the picture. You got to paint the picture. All right. That this, their history has not, right? When it's told in the schools, only quote unquote, only quote unquote, white people talk history is taught in school. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a, to say that, because their history is not taught in schools either. Mm. Let's, let's, put, let's, let's be clear. 
European history is not taught in the schools either. Mm. I'm talking about the true. true history. That's true. Because yeah. be, right, they this is the misconception. Because yeah. you have Afrocentric folks that put out the misconception only white people history is taught in school. Their history is not taught in schools either. That's facts. So I want to, I want to add, you know, no. support what you're saying. That's, their history is not taught in schools either. That's, and that's talking about a history that's not taught in school yeah. about Irish working their butts all getting beat down. All right. That's not what. Well, well, you know, a lot of that. And I'm gonna change gears for a second, but good. I just wanted to... a lot. Of, no, that, that, that's that's a good segue. A lot of that. Let me go back mm -hmm. for, for y'all listening, because we, we, we're in the same room, y'all didn't know. So we, we, we kind of just talking anyway. Yeah, and y'all yeah. got the privilege of hearing us have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. let me just wrap up the Templars piece for a second. So yeah, yes. when the Templars got ran out of Turkey in 1191, uh, you know, the whole decree about October 13, 13, whatever, 13, the number 13, um, uh, was it Pope, Pope Innocent? One of the popes had decreed something on the Knight Templars because they found out some information. I think it's innocent. They 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 found out some information uh that the Pope didn't want to get out. Pious. So so innocent. the so the Pope ended up issuing this decree to basically now that the Knight Templars have amassed this great amount of wealth mm -hmm. to, to become a Knight Templar by the way you have to give up your land. You have to give up all your possessions. They call they, they call poor fellows of Christ for a reason. You have to give up all your land and possessions, and those decrees and those those land acquisitions went right to the Vatican. So then the Vatican is usurping the land under religious pretense to fight for Christ. This is the, this is this is the this is not the army of God. I can talk about the army of God too. This is whole of the army. They become allegiance with the army of God, though, and I'm not talking about uh, this uh, deity uh, in the sky. You know, the governmental ordinance department, but. The Knight Templars get ran out of that area, but at this time they have amassed so much wealth, treasures, because they didn't have any currency. They had gold back then. They amassed so much treasures and wealth that the ones who did get away, they sailed out of northern Africa through the Suez Canal down to what we call today the Indian Ocean around Africa, and they headed out west towards Barbados. When they were met, a decree got issued to go on the seas and get these motherfuckers. They, they killed a lot of them. They, they burned them at the state. They were so easy to spot, family, because they had a big old white sail with a red cross on it. They still flew the cross. Now, they had that cross, which was the cross of the hospital, but it was another cross with four crosses around it called the Crestrian Cross. They were easily to spot the Crestrian Cross. So that's how they got boarded and got subdued, right, because they knew who they were. Now, here what they did. They took down that flag, they took down that hoist, and they put up a black hoist with the skull of John the Baptist and two femur bones. But look it up. These are still Christians. And in the Masonic order, they 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 have a circle with a dot with two sides on it, and these two lines represents John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. And they ask you of what are you, what order are you from? You say, from the lodge of the holy Saint John's of Jerusalem. So they put up this black flag with the white skull because you know John the Baptist got beheaded. That's the that's the Masonic thing. That's that, that's the, the sabotage. That flag is a Moorish. That black flag ties to us. That's um. The black flag with the white letters on it. Is, is a, yeah, the black flag from Arabia. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's our flag. Um, it's it's a uh, I think a. Uh, Amity flag or something like that. Yeah, I, yeah. It's it's, I'm, it's the only I'm flag. To talk, I'm to, that's the only flag. Whatever they can, they can fly it, say it so I can, I'm out to, the sea. To, that's know, the only flag we call under maritime law. Yeah, that's the ahead. only flag that they can fly out to sea. All right, there you go. That's basically. So I'm, that's, I'm, the, yeah, that's, that's the that's only that's flag they can fly yeah. out to sea, right? Yes, yes. Which becomes a tobacco later with with uh, the founding colonies because they had no amity flag at this point. Betsy hasn't sewn together the flag yet for America. They don't have anything. They can't go out to see do nothing. So they had to ask Morocco, hey, 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 recognize us first as a nation so we can get our trade on. We can start trade. It was called mercantilism. There was no capitalism. It was called mercantilism. That's all they had, merchants.
So these merchants, Knight Templars, are now doing trade in the Caribbeans. Yeah. And what I'm really giving y'all is the story of pirating. You know, how they painted in movies, how pirates always had big chests of gold, those bouillants, they call it booty. These bouillon coat goals are always further worded back even to the twelve hundreds. <laughs> right. Oh, it it goes way back. With Argon and Castile and the House of Castile and Oregon had joined yeah, House of Castile and House of Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. because of Isabella. Mm -hmm. Isabella, who was a Moorish and Ferne. And who was House a Moor. Argon. There was an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. And they knew by marrying her to him, everything that was under her dominion now becomes under his dominion. All the all the airship, the uh, what do you call this shit, man? When you put it in a trust, because they never came married, that that trust became his trust. Like it goes back, family. So, so going forward to this uh, slave thing you brought up, brother, I'm not a huge component. Yeah, we got a couple of little minutes. I, I'm not a huge component. Never have been. I think Crum and I had this discussion years ago, but I don't. I'm not a champion of the African diaspora for our people here in North America. I don't believe in that story. Um, there's, there's no supporting evidence to support the story. Mm -hmm. Anybody that believes, uh, be like Eve, Dr. York said, find Eve's children. <laughs> Anybody that be like Eve's, that story that you were brought out of Africa mm. across the wretched seas over here and dropped off, and your civilization did not begin until the African put hit Virginia mm -hmm. in this territory, you're sadly mistaken. Um, from, from, from my research, only about 19 Africans were ever brought to North America. And I had to be taught to rephrase the question to people who think this and ask them, what was the Atlantic slave trade? And allow them to tell that it was a time in history where mm. uh, our ancestors mm. were brought out of Africa mm. and brought them to North America and were, thank you, and were made to do uh, labor. Uh, and I asked them, when was this? Because there was no cotton prior to 1801. So what was they doing when they got here? These these hardworking Africans, when they first got to North America, first I asked which America they come to. And they look at me like I'm crazy. What you mean? Yeah, what, 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 which yeah. America did they come to? If they say North America, I have to ask them what time period was this? When? Give me a time. Was it 1700s? Because America only had 10 colonies. There was no South yet. What were they working at? You know, you had the rice fields in South Carolina, you had Virginia with cotton, yeah, tobacco, yeah, but yeah. they were still in what's called today uh, um, Hampton County. They haven't went out far enough to get the tobacco, tobacco out of York County. They haven't came across Nat Turner yet in the Natchez people. That's out there. It's up. I used to live there. I know. They haven't. Europeans were held to the coastal territories of Virginia. They they couldn't come inland. The uh, Pamoki, the Pamoki Indians wouldn't allow it. Okay. The Natchez wouldn't allow it. They kick their ass every time, right? Certain movies will show you how these Europeans hit the coast and they hung out on the beach the whole time. That's why they love the beach. That's where they come from. They understand that that's the safest place to be, not so far inland. Now, as you go through time, and I asked this question about these so-called Africans coming to America, what were they doing when they got here? Give me the time people were doing. Picking cotton, too early for cotton. That's a lot. 1806... England outlaws the importation of Africans into America. It's outlawed on the seas. You can't do it anymore. It's it's over with. If you didn't get that, uh, what was that, 1496 with John Hawkins all the way to 1785, you didn't get that window to bring niggas out of Africa to America, the window's closed now. You can't do it no more. No more free labor. So I asked them, now, when the Negroes were banned over here to come into America, how did these Negroes magically appear after the War of 1812 picking cotton in, in, in the South? Something called was called the Second Great Migration. I'm sorry, the Second uh, Transatlantic Slave Trade. It was called Domestic Slave Trade. That's when they snatched niggas from New York, Baltimore, uh, 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 Philly. They snatched them off the coast, threw them on these schooners. Schooners. They just cargo ships. And yet they're packed like sardines because they had to make room for the whiskey and the wheat and the barley and the grits. Yeah, they packed like this for a reason. It's like putting Mexicans in the trunk. It's the same fucking concept. Excuse my language. But they brought them around Florida and came out to where? New Orleans and Mississippi and Alabama. And the movie 12 Years a Slave, I keep telling y'all to watch this movie. The 12 Years a Slave, they captured their brother out of D.C., brought him down to New Orleans. He came off the ship. I was like, where am I at? White boy slapped him and said, your name just got changed. 
It's the Toby concept again. Slapped him and changed his name on the pier. Now, he had left America. Why were Negroes trying to run back up north for freedom? No, it's where they were from. They're trying to go back home. You from Cincinnati. I drop you off in Georgia and abandon you on the side of the highway. Where are you going to go back naturally? Back north home. Well, yeah, I mean, that's... The Negroes from the south never ran north. Never ran north. During slavery, nobody that was from the south ever went north because slavery was in the north as well. And you would be recruited to join the Union Army. Down here, the best place to go was Florida because Florida belonged to Spain. The time period, people. The time period is important, Ain't right? A pound in that brother. So once these, I'm gonna say this to Pastor Mike. Once these European, the Europeans were brought to North America to work. Let's be clear about this. These vagabonds, these yeah. serfs, right. they were serfs. They were they were debt slaves. Yeah. These serfs, snatched up and put in prison. These serfs yeah. belonged to a territory. And this territory was owned by a feudal lord. In our time, they're called governors. They call a governor. The feudal lord over the territory. Let us thank the Lord for our daily bread. It wasn't talking about the guy in the sky. They were literally lords who owned the territory. And these serfs could not leave the territory. And the sheriffs were tasked to govern the manors. Call it manor. Serfs on a manor. Yeah. What's a manor here? A yeah. manor is a state. 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 Citizens are the serfs. Yeah. The sheriffs govern the county, which means conquered land, by the way, to keep you in bounds of everything. So they brought their structure over here. But these serfs who came to America in the early 1700s decided that, hey, man, seven years is a long time. I don't want to do this in future servitude no more. What part of this land don't we own yet? Uh, you go past South Carolina, it's open territory. We don't know who owned that yet. Okay. So you had whew, thousands of white runaway slaves come to the state of Georgia. And these white runaway slaves got into it with the uh, Yamacraw and the Kawita and the Yamansi and the Gullah. They stayed squamishing amongst each other because they didn't belong down here in the first place until a white boy out of Europe by the name of James Oglethorpe got permission to get a charter, and he carved out a demarcation line. See, the same dirt in Georgia is the same dirt in Alabama. It's the same dirt. There's no line to separate Georgia. It's the same dirt. You can find plum bushes growing in Georgia and Alabama on the same, it's the same dirt. The same dirt in Georgia, the same dirt in California. The same dirt. Who separates the dirt? It's a demarcation line. So James Oberthorpe came to set up the territory of Georgia, and he tricked the Indian chief, got his name. He took the Indian chief, he was a Yamacra Indian chief from Georgia, took him to, to Europe, wind and dine him, brought him back. He signed the treaty, and that's when James Oglethorpe sent his son, Robert Duval, and Captain uh, Andrew Jackson to blow up Fort Negro and to keep them niggas at bay and to keep them Negroes from coming back into Georgia because they was coming into Georgia still burning down these white villages who was trying to establish themselves in Georgia. See what I'm saying? So once that happened, Jackson did that Jacksonville became known as Duval County from his son. So this is all corral and I'm and I'm only studying Georgia because it's where I'm from. And and it, and it, and it's and it's mind blowing when I found out that these states are established under these um pieces of paper. And these treaties yeah. these treaties yeah. were contract. Yeah. And to understand and I'm let you speak on this to understand what a charter is how who issued them charters to set up this land for these europeans and this is just james overthrow who who what is the you talking about that charter right uh, yeah the, the so, crown the british crown every state has a charter that's the seal it's the establishing something that, that's their established well, they, 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 all right so that's that's so that's um you have the the, the english crown mm -hmm. that you have you got spain and Portugal, Sweden, Netherlands, you know. So they, there's more than one European power. So they extended their what's called they extended that. Let's let's go back. Let's go back. Pope Alexander the Sixth is a set a royal decree. Enter Catera Divina. Pepper Bull, yeah. All right. March fourth, 
1493. I'm, I'm connecting all this. This is what that's called the doctrine of discovery. This is what they so they use that in international law. In international law, you have what's called acquisition of territory. Discovery falls under the category of acquisition of territory. This it's just conquest. They have this discovery. Eminent domain fills in it too. Con conquest. Yeah, I'm gonna tie that in. Discovery, conquest, subjugation, and annexation. Mm. So these Europeans have in international law to maintain their conquest and set the, the legal boundaries in international law and it classified as acquisition of territory or loss of sovereignty all right once again doctrine of discovery got discovery conquest subjugation and annexation now let's look at discovery that's discovery the doctrine of discovery which is the intercaterra divina march 4 1493 you have what's a term called terra nullius, land without people. Mm. When they show in the textbooks that the native people who are us living in teepees, why do they show, why is shown in textbooks just teepees and not permanent structure? Because teepee does not rep represent what? Nomadic, no permanent structure. No, no fix mm. or, or no claim. The TP represents no claim to the land, but that's a farce. You have Teach, you, you have you have underground cities. All right, copper mine, ancient copper mines. You have pyramids and mound pyramids and actual fixtures. They don't show that because they're pushing their doctrine of discovery claim or terra nullius which is tied to eminent domain all right and what they what they also called um squatting in the domain it's another another term um when you get you get the uh they have extended state laws when you when you when you occupy a particular house for like five or ten twenty years mm -hmm. which those that's called that's called no that's squatting it's another term. Um, well, that's all. That's all. That's all. The, that's all tied to it. They call it abandoned land, and you can go claim it. Right. And if it's if you say stay, you stay there for ten years, then you take you take it down to the court. All right. They have that in all state. Right. But that's all tied to terra nullius. Mm. It's all that's still not part of their doctrine of discovery. All right. So this is this is all tied in. So. Spain and Portugal is given that royal decree, all right, to, so Spain to this very day, that is still operating. Great, Great Britain, Sweden, they all, they all make the claim on discovery. Mm. So we have to counter that. So that, that's getting, that's, that's, that's further off. Let's go to this. Now you have the great, the English crown slash British crown. You have there's three types of colonies. You have the royal colony, company colony, and proprietary colony. A royal colony is where the crown issues a a sets up a colony and put a governor. So the colony is actually being controlled by the crown through a governor. A proprietary colony, i.e. Pennsylvania. William William Penn's William Penn's father, William Penn was a seen viewed as a troublemaker in Europe. And he was put in prison. Yep. His father, Charles II, King Charles II of England, owed William Penn's father a debt. So William Penn's father called on the debt and made the negotiation negotiate with Charles II to have his son be, be released from prison. And have them set up a colony. Prisoners, told all right, you. a colony. <laughs> so, so William Penn was released, and a a a, a charter is called a. So William Penn was the proprietor. So William Penn controlled the colony. It wasn't the Charlie was not controlled by Charles II. 
the charter was issued by Charles II. The colony was not, Charles II did not appoint a governor to Pennsylvania. William Penn did that. William Penn controlled the colony. Mm. That's called a proprietary colony. Virginia is a company ch- uh, um, colony. So, yeah. so we got it set so they can understand that there's three types of colonies. And those colonies are set up by charters. Now, now you have you have Georgia Colony, Georgia State, not one and the same. Mm-hmm. Georgia Colony, that's the that's the colony set up. All right, well, that's all Orchidor, or Orchidor, James Orchidor, yeah, Orchidor, yeah, seventeen thirty-two. That's Georgia Colony. Now, in the seventeen seventy, the seventeen eighty-three Treaty of Paris, that's the definitive peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States that ended the Revolutionary War. So the so the the rest of the conception as the colony became the state. What the so in the in the colonies charters lay lay out the boundaries, meets and bounds. So Virginia State is operating on the boundary markers that's laid set out in the that that are in the Georgia colony charters. You have the Georgia State, Georgia Colony, Georgia Colony Charter. So so through the treaty, so Great Britain, in that treaty, Great Britain acknowledges the United States as free, sovereign, and independent. All right? So that, so that, so now, take, so not, so Georgia secedes the charter, secedes that. And then so they're operating on that, on, they're op- still operating on that type. They're making claims to the charter. Georgia State is making claims to the Georgia County Charter. They're operating on the bounds of the Georgia County Charter, Virginia County Charter, Virginia State, Pennsylvania County Charter, all right? Proprietary Charter, then you have Virginia State, all right? Come over for Pennsylvania, all right? And so forth. So these things are in operation today. Wow. So what is the issue for Moors? Is one, to know that they're Moors. Mm-hmm. And to we have to we have to organize into government structure, bring our mother, the Moroccan Empire, out of political a coma. That's called an extinction, dismemberment, collapse of a state. The the remedy in international law is called recovery, the recovery of lost sovereignty. So we have to we have to organize into government structure. To reclaim or to bring our mother out of a coma. Right now, our mother is in a coma, means a prolonged state of political inactivity or extinction or collapse or disintegration. So, we do have something. We have a state that's been collapsed. We have to bring her back to political life. Her children, more, who are classified as Black, Negro, Color, Latino, Spanish, Puerto Rican, Indian, West Indian, are subjugated are under subjugation by Spain and Portugal and France and Sweden and the Netherlands on their own land. So so this is the key. Now, let me explain. Mm. Uh, let me give a understanding here. That's how we have more. They put more on your forehead. More on your forehead, right? So they'll take care of you. More on your forehead. And they put black. You put black in, on a box. Put black on the box. Well, you're more. So put more on your forehead and we place you into the box that has black on it. You're not black. You're more who's placed into a box or legal fictional category called black. Mm. That's all that is. So our people have been conditioned that they're black. No, we're black. We're black. No, no, you're... Black is a legal fictional category box. You're more that's placed in a legal fictional category block box, which steals your birthright, mm. which makes you non descendable. It steals your inheritance. Yes, we're on our land. Yes, we're on our land. We ain't going to go on our land. We don't have control of our land and resources. There's not an issue that we got to find land and resources. We own it right now. We don't have con- control of it. All right, so I just wanted to provide. No, that. that was that was a nice, nice uh, 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 
measure, brother. Um, let me see if I can put this up here right quick. So, so listen, if you don't know by now, October, we'll be bringing you a uh, knowledge uh, and enlightenment um, seminar is what I'm calling it because I think the term seminar um, fits it best. Um, I'm not going to call it a retreat because it's not a retreat. Don't come to relax. Come ready to learn. Uh, give me a second. I try to find a flyer for y'all. Here we go. Um, but come ready to learn. We have a lot of great people there, including this brother you see on screen, right? He's going to be there as well in the building doing great. There we go. There we go. All right, we're back. So just kind of give us a, a a quick summary of why do this? This is just for you now. Why do the newspaper? Why do the the the, the literature? Like why even do it? Why, why are you doing it? Well, 